Hello and welcome to the latest edition of WVU Medicine Tuesday Talks. I'm your host, Mary Ravazio Menard. Hospitals across the country, including WVU Medicine Children's here in Morgantown, are dealing with a spike in cases of respiratory syncytial virus, or RSV. RSV can cause a common cold that can be treated at home, but it can also lead to more serious respiratory infections. How can you tell if it's just a cold or something more serious? How do you treat RSV? Today, we're talking with WVU Medicine Children's emergency medicine physician, Dr. Edgar Petrus, about how to handle RSV, when to treat it at home, and when to call your doctor. Welcome, Dr. Petrus, to Tuesday Talks. Thank you for having me. Great to have you here. If you have any RSV questions for Dr. Petrus, just enter them in the comments section below and we'll try to answer them live. Okay, well, you know, <laughs> just a couple weeks ago, we were talking about flu shots mm -hmm. and COVID and mm -hmm. a possibility of a twindemic. <laughs> And here we are two weeks later, we're talking about possibly a tridemic if we include RSV. Yeah. So let's first talk about what exactly is RSV. Right. So RSV stands for respiratory syncytial virus, like you said. And it's an incredibly common, ubiquitous virus that's been around for a long time that causes respiratory infections in people of all ages. And it uh, can range in what it causes, like you said, and we'll get into more details later. Um, and it causes uh, illness in a somewhat predictable seasonal pattern. So here in the Northern Hemisphere, we typically see cases from October throughout the winter until you know February, March or so. Okay. Um, how much of an increase in RSV-related illnesses are you seeing at uh, the WVU Medicine mm -hmm. Children's Emergency Department? The short answer is we're seeing a lot of cases, and we're seeing more cases than we have in the past couple of years. I don't have hard numbers or, or specific data, um, but it's clear that we are seeing more, and it's not a phenomenon that is unique to WVU medicine. Again, like yeah. you said, this is something that is that is affecting hospitals and emergency departments across the country, across the East Coast, out in California. Um, if you go on your just news sites, NBC, it's, it's a lot of people are talking about this oh, right yeah. now. Oh yeah, this is the hot topic. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, but I think we we opened our new premises you know, just in time, it feels like, because we yeah. do have more space in our emergency department to, to treat kids. Um, and so we've certainly been able to uh, to utilize the hospital to the, the most of its capabilities um, in these in these first couple of weeks that we've been open. Good time to have a shiny new emergency department. It is indeed, <laughs> yeah. Um, so did this RSV season start earlier than usual? Are you seeing this increase in cases sooner than It's you know I don't usual? think it would I don't think I'd say it started earlier cuz you know the beginning of respiratory season which is what we all call it is typically about October. Okay. I think the the thing that we are seeing is that we have reached very high levels levels that are typically reserved for peak season, you know, in the throes of winter, January, February, uh, we're seeing those levels now. And it's really hard to tell if this is going to be an early spike and things are going to kind of kind of wane off. It's We don't know how high it's going to go and how, how many cases we're going to see. And so it's really hard to predict the future. And, and we don't you know, we don't have a crystal ball. We can't look into the future and say how, how bad it's going to get. Why do you think we're seeing an increase in, in, in RSV cases right now? <laughs> it's, it's very easy in 2022 to blame everything on the coronavirus yeah. pandemic. So I'll yeah. just I'll jump on that bandwagon. <laughs> and I think the, the seasonal variation that we all see, and it, it, it is predictable through, from year to year, um, is due to human behavior, you know? And so as things get colder, we stay inside more and all of these things. Well, the coronavirus pandemic, you know, forced a lot of change in behavior for all of us for two years. And so I think as we see behaviors change and return somewhat to normal, that is probably why we're seeing such a, a rise in cases recently and kids that were maybe more sheltered and weren't going out to play or to school or to daycare. Maybe those kids are getting you know more interaction and kind mm -hmm. of sharing viruses in a different way than we'd seen in the past couple yeah, of years. Sure. Um, and so I, I think that's probably anyone's best guess in terms of why this is happening. So 
this is RSV seems to be pretty common in in babies mm -hmm. and and young children, doesn't it? RSV is incredibly common. I was um, doing a little bit of research to prepare for today, and there are some some sources that say that essentially every child will have contracted or at least been exposed oh, to wow. RSV by the age of two. So there wow. is a very good case that your child, even if they have not gotten seriously ill, has been exposed or, or gotten RSV. The problem is, is that RSV infection doesn't really provide a huge robust immunity and so reinfections are, are very common. Oh. And so that's why this continues to be a problem year after year. And that's why we, we don't really have a good robust um, uh, vaccine to RSV either. There is a vaccine out there. It is something that is reserved for those that are at highest risk of severe disease, and we'll get into that in a little bit. Okay. Um, but it's something that needs to be administered monthly throughout RSV season. And so oh, that's wow. that's really reserved for the kids that are born very premature, or have very serious heart conditions or serious respiratory conditions. You mentioned that you, know, you can get it again. Can you get mm -hmm. it? again in the same season? You can. Yeah, and I don't wow. I don't you know, can't tell you exactly how long you're protected after you get it, but certainly you, you can pick it up again in, in the hmm. same season. Reinfections or, or secondary infections tend to be less severe, which okay. is good, um, but yes, you can. Okay. Now, um, RSV I know can cause bronchiolitis hmm. in children. So tell us about bronchiolitis. What yeah. what's that and what are the symptoms to look sure. for? So bronchiolitis is a illness that is diagnosed clinically, meaning that your doctor will diagnose it by talking to the parent of the child and examining the child, listening to their lungs, and kind of seeing what's going on. There's no confirmatory test that will diagnose RSV, or yeah. bronchiolitis rather. Um, bronchiolitis is something that we, we see and we look at and we hear. A chest x-ray does not diagnose bronchiolitis. A RSV test does not diagnose bronchiolitis. And it's really a syndrome of congestion, fever, cough, sometimes wheezing, sometimes increased work of breathing or increased uh, respiratory effort or just trouble breathing for these kids. Uh, and it is a diagnosis that is usually almost always made in kids that are two and under. Which is really scary because yeah. they can't really tell you what they're feeling and what's wrong sometimes. No, they, <laughs> they can't, but they, they tell you in their own ways, right? Yeah. And so. Um, the things to look out for with, with bronchiolitis are kind of what we talked about. And so we'll, we can talk about the course a little bit now um, yeah, of bronchiolitis. Ahead. And so typically what we see with bronchiolitis, which I want to be clear, bronchiolitis is most often caused by RSV, but it can be caused by a number of other respiratory viruses out there as well. So typically see a day or two of the child getting some runny nose, congestion, uh, then it might start worsening with a cough. And by day two or three or so, if the kid is going to have a more severe case, we start to see that increased work of breathing. Your child will be kind of breathing faster. Maybe you'll see their ribs or their belly will be working harder as they're breathing. And we tend to see the worst illness around day three to four to five of symptoms. And then things tend to get better from there. Okay. okay? The one thing that I always share with my parents that I'm talking to in the emergency department is that the cough associated with bronchiolitis can linger. It can linger as long as two, three, four weeks even. Oh, wow. That's a yeah. long time. It is a long time. And so we see a lot of people coming in saying, you know, my kid's not getting better. They, they were sick. They got, you know, their fever has gotten better. They're not as tired. But, man, they're, they're still just coughing a ton. And that's not unusual. Okay. So you can maybe give your child something to help with the cough, to treat the symptoms, or do you just yeah. let it run its course? So all of the treatment for bronchiolitis is gonna be what we call supportive care. And so okay. I break down supportive care into what support can we provide at home and what support would need to be provided in the hospital. And a lot of what can be done can be done at home. So let's talk about the fever. So fever makes, makes kids feel bad. They just don't wanna eat, they don't wanna drink, they wanna mm -hmm. lay around and do nothing. The fever itself is largely not dangerous. We, we see a lot of parents that are concerned about the number of the fever is, yeah. it's, it's really high. Um, unless we're talking very unusually high fevers, it's not gonna be dangerous in and of itself. Okay. But we treat fever to make the kids feel better. <laughs> we treat fever so that the kids can feel better and drink and stay hydrated. And so number one is gonna be supporting that child with ibuprofen and Tylenol, okay? 
Um, generally, we reserve ibuprofen for six months and over, but Tylenol is safe for all ages. Um, and the one thing that you know every pediatrician will tell you is that a fever in a very young children, two months and under, should always, always, always be evaluated by a physician. Okay. Yeah. All right. So then how do you know, you mm -hmm. know, when, when should I just, you know, treat this at home or when should I bring my child to the emergency mm -hmm. department or to the doctor? Yeah. So we covered fever. The other thing that we talked about was that work of breathing. So cough, again, very, very common. We, mm -hmm. we, there's not a whole lot of good medications out there for cough. One thing that is easy to give children over a year is honey. Honey has been shown to actually help cough in, in some very good trials. Um, safe again after that one year of age. Okay. Um, and then just humidified air, good steamy showers, things like that. For the, the young kids who are really congested, we recommend suctioning out their nose. Oh, always a good time. It's, <laughs> yeah, it's always fun. And before I was a parent, I always laughed at the idea of these uh, the nasal suction where it's just a tube that you suck in with your mouth and there's a filter there. They work phenomenally well, actually. And so oh, if you wow. can kind of get over the mental block of doing that, yeah. you can get a, a lot of congestion and a lot of, um, a lot of that drainage out from your, your child's nose. Yeah. When you start to see your kid struggling to breathe, certainly if you, if you feel like they're blue or purple around the lips, if you feel like they're not able to stay hydrated and they're getting dehydrated and they're, they're not peeing, those are the kids that need to be evaluated. I think a lot of cases can be seen at their pediatrician's office. If you have a good relationship with your pediatrician and, and you're able to be seen in a timely manner, mm -hmm. I think most of those cases can be seen in the office. But if you're worried that your child is having difficulty breathing, mm -hmm. we're more than happy to see them in the emergency department. Okay. Good to know. Mm -hmm. um, so you talked about how RSV is treated. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what you can do, what parents can do to right. treat the symptoms. Can you treat RSV with antibiotics? Antibiotics is, is a hard no. It's, it's a virus, right? And so right. That's, that's an easy one to say. Antibiotics don't have any role in the treatment of bronchiolitis or RSV. There's a lot of other things, since this is so common, we, we've tried a lot and we have good studies on a lot of mm -hmm. things. Unfortunately, none of them really show much benefit. And so very common things that we get questions about, steroids, steroids not really shown to have any help and improvement mm -hmm. to decrease how long kids are sick, to keep kids out of the hospital. Steroids just aren't really shown to be a whole lot helpful. Another one that we see extremely commonly is albuterol, which is an inhaled medicine that's often used for mm -hmm. asthmatics. Part of the, the sound that we hear when listening to kids with bronchiolitis is a wheeze that is typical with, with asthma as well. When we study populations of thousands of kids, mm -hmm. albuterol does not help. Now, there are some, probably some individual cases that may be helped with albuterol. So sometimes when you're at your doctor, they might try a dose of albuterol to see if your child is sure. improved and responded. And that, that is something that may help. But when we're talking about broad populations of kids, albuterol is, is not something that, that everyone should be or is getting. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, how long is, if you have RSV, how long is it contagious and when are you most contagious? So you're most contagious when, when you're sick. You know, when the when your child is coughing, hacking, sneezing everywhere, that's going to be your most contagious period. And RSV, unlike some other infections, is not as much of a problem as uh, in the air. It's not a big aerosolized infection. Oh, okay. There's probably some implication with, with big droplets and, and things like that. Um, but it's mostly what we call our, our fomites. And fomites, in a very uh, basic sense, are I cough on your mug, you touch the mug, you touch yourself, and that's how you get sick. Okay. And the tricky thing with RSV is that it can live on mugs, on doorknobs, on tables oh, for wow. hours, eight hours or so, really? even longer. Yeah. Ooh. And so that's what makes it very common, right, and very easily spreadable. Um, and, you know, when we look at the amount of virus that kids are shedding, they can be shedding virus from three to eight to 11 days, 14 days, depending oh, on what we're using and man. what studies you look at. So you can be contagious for a long time. Okay, okay. And, and that means they can, kids can give it to their parents, right? Because adults can get RSV, right? Adults can get RSV for adults, um, you know, since we have bigger airways and kind of more just physically larger lungs and things, it's not as much of a problem. But adults can get it. It's typically going to cause, you know, common cold like like symptoms and then you can pass it on. Yeah. So it tends to be more serious in in children. Exactly. Because they're just 
smaller. Right. So let's talk about risk factors yes. then. Yes. Yeah. Let's talk about risk factors. So risk factors for serious disease. We're going to see a lot, a lot of children with RSV. The ones we're concerned about are the ones that are going to have the serious disease, the ones that will need breathing support in the hospital. The ones that are most at risk of that are children that were born premature, particularly young children, like under four months of age, and then children with uh, with chronic medical conditions, particularly of the heart and lungs. And so children oh. with congenital heart disease or children with bronchopulmonary dysplasia um, or other you know, chronic medical conditions. I think those are the kids that we need to be really careful about limiting their exposure to RSV mm -hmm. and doing what we can to make sure they don't, don't con contract it. Okay. All right. Well, how do you prevent it then? How do you keep from <laughs> contracting it when it's, when it's everywhere? Yeah, uh, so cleaning, right? And so yes, I think yes. really, you know, getting out the, the Lysol wipes or the, the Clorox wipes, I don't want to pitch any particular no, brand. No but, particular brand. But yeah, cleaning mm. those things that are your high touch surfaces, your, your doorknobs, your, your cups, your things, maybe running the dishwasher on that sanitized feature to really get everything off the plates and the dishes and things like that. And then keeping sick kids home when possible. You know, as a working parent who is, is married to another physician, it's, it's hard. Yeah. Um, and, and I understand how difficult that can be. But sure. I think just, just limiting our exposure and then particularly limiting our exposure to, to small babies. And so maybe if grandma has a cough, now is not the best time to introduce to the new baby that's just coming home from the NICU or, or something like that. Okay. Yeah, and does it, does it affect babies more so than... Um, older children. I it mean, does. Yeah. I would say your your risk goes down almost with every day you're alive, right? <laughs> and so and so your child that is, is three months old is going to be a higher risk than the four-month-old child, is going to be higher risk than your six-month-old child, and so on and so forth. And okay. so really protecting those those younger kids is as best as possible. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, um, I always like to do this at the uh, near the end here before we go. Mm -hmm. What do you consider the most important thing that you want parents to know mm -hmm. um, about RSV? I think it's a it's a common misconceptions thing. So, if you have a young child this winter, at some point they're probably going to get sick. All right, oh, yeah. a vast vast majority of those kids are going to be great at home with your home remedies that have been passed down for a long time that are good for a reason. Staying hydrated, chicken soup, you know your your juices, your um, your broths, your popsicles, all those things that are essentially all water <laughs> to keep yeah. your kid hydrated. Those are all great for a reason because kids will they'll take them, they'll soothe them, and and those things. Your humidified baths and stuff like that. Just because your kid is sick, if you can take care of them at home, great. We encourage you to do that. And if you have concerns, talk to your doctor. And if you're really worried about how they're breathing or about their hydration status you know where to find us at the WV Children's Emergency Department. And the second one is the fever. We do see a lot of, a lot of parents in the emergency department yeah. that are worried about the fever. The fever itself is our body's way of trying to get rid of the infection. Yeah. And, there's not, and there's not really a number that we get concerned about that is gonna be a problem. Treat the fever, please. Give your child medication to bring that number down so they feel better. Yeah. But if the number comes down and they're, they're feeling better with treatment, then that's great. Keep it up. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much. You shared a lot of really good information I, I that hope, we can I, use. Yeah, I hope this was helpful because we're seeing RSV all over the news, and and you know, it's, you know, hospitals are are full, and we're busy in the emergency department. And so, I just want to make sure everyone is, is knows as much as possible before coming to see us. All right. Thank yeah. you so much. Sure. Appreciate it. Well, that brings us to the end of this edition of Tuesday Talks. If you're looking for more information about WVU Medicine Children's, visit wvukids.com. And be sure to join us on Tuesday Talks on November 8th when we'll be talking about sleep medicine with Dr. Christopher Pham from the WVU Medicine Sleep Evaluation Center. I'm Mary Ravazio Menard, and on behalf of Dr. Petrus and everyone at WVU Medicine, Thanks for joining us and have a great day.